with the Falcon. Yeah, I just, I, you know, kudos for all this testing. Okay, we're going uh, live, but, by the way. All right, kudo, yeah, kudos yeah. for all this testing, but it just seems like, why make it so hard to save what must be a tiny amount of fuel over slowing down a kilometer up? And especially when they're planning to land on floating platforms and things in the future, <laughs> it's just like you leave it. The margin of error is so small, yeah. like seemingly so unnecessarily Yeah. that I just, it, and especially on these tests, like even on a test, they could do it higher up to give yeah, themselves a chance to recover or whatever. I just don't understand why they've cut the corner so tightly. Yeah. And lost it's two rockets like so far. Yeah, right. I believe that they will grab it out of the air. Yeah, yeah, I believe that they will succeed, but and maybe they will succeed ninety nine percent of the time. But when it goes bad, it's going to go bad so fast. Yeah, that they're planning to put people on it like that. Yeah, yeah. You take your, you take your. Tra- Can you just imagine being on your transatlantic flight on one of these things? You're strapped in, and then. You know, you're falling. You're in like z- literally falling, and then well, it's like if you landed on the launch or landed on the runway at 500 miles an hour, and then they yeah. slam the brakes on as you head towards the like yeah. you know the end of the runway. Yeah, it's just that would be a stupid way to design a yeah. plane. I will and never. It seems like a stupid way to design. I a will rocket. never take. Well, a although I have flight. flown on flights that were piloted by Navy pilots. And they seem to like to do that. <laughs> oh, you're landing on the carrier and it's all or nothing. Yeah, so, <laughs> what is hit the brakes? It's the other way. It feels like home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I won't do it. I can't I can't even just imagine, right? You're fall you're you're you've got the the flight, the parabolic flight, and so you're you're you know, some level of, of feeling weightless, and then you're falling through the atmosphere. And and feeling the buffeting of the wind, and then at that last minute, the rocket wrenches itself around, and you land. Right. And it's just so undignified to die on your back. It's <laughs> just, like if it doesn't turn around, you're oriented on your back to start with. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. It's a big ask to to get anywhere in the world in forty five minutes. I don't know. It's tr- that's a tough one. Well, given the stocks are, you know, they they like the idea of the rich people taking the flights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take your flights. All right, I'm gonna say hi to some people. Hello to wait. What? Hold on. We move the chat. Okay, there we go. Hello to Andrew Planet, Astro B, Ben Kalo, Bob Moeller, Chippy Shirt, Christian Woodland, Corey S, David Chudwin, David Dunn, David Fairweather, Harry Patrick, Johnny J, Johnny Z, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Luke Duke, Nancy Graziano, Neko Girl, Pamela Hoffman, hey Pam, watching, Rich Wilson, you have the night off, uh, Arjone, Ryan Schmitz, Sergusi, Susan Hunter, Visto Tutti, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey everybody, welcome. Jamie S, Six Paul Holmes, Christopher Green, a bunch of last minute names there all right well let's just get started I feel like we're all everyone's just raring to go so I'm not gonna <laughs> stop you okay speaker view back to me okay Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, February 3rd, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about simulating black holes in the bathtub. Phosphine on Venus? Not so fast. SN9 goes kaboom. SN10, you're up. And six transiting planets in residence found in an extrasolar planetary system. Joining me this week... Let's see. All the way from Taiwan, we got Alex CG. Hey, Alex. Hey, Fraser. How you doing? Good. You were you were just regaling me with your beautiful weather there. Oh yeah, it's seventy five degrees and sunny every day this week. It's it's really it's really nice. Sorry, everyone. It's yeah. really nice here in Taiwan. <laughs> seventy five <laughs> degrees. That's almost like boiling for mm. Canadians. So maybe <laughs> do they do they use the metric system there? 
Yeah, that, it's all on Celsius. I, I don't know. It's yeah, 20, all right, all right. 20, I don't know. That, that, that'd be like the first it, part of you learning Chinese is just to learn their <laughs> their measurement system. Celsius. I know roughly what it is. Yeah, yeah okay, it's good all right, to all right. Grab right. a jacket long, or not? As long yeah. as you've, you can understand how it's done. We also got uh, yeah. Dr. Brian Coberline. Brian, hey, good to be back again. I need to fix everybody's camera. Okay. Um, it's the show is set for Pamela's camera, and she's like sitting on a couch usually like when we're doing astronomy cast like it's a totally different setup and i have to like fix it every time we so anyway you guys have no idea what i'm talking about i'm just babbling and we've got uh, dr morgan Renberg. hey morgan it is also in the 70s here in texas yeah so uh sorry for all you under a blizzard sorry brian <laughs> yeah yeah i just have to dig out snow uh oh yeah um, all right, so uh, before we get on with our very special guest, I want to give a brief shout out to our good friends of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are our friends, they are our fans, they really are executive producers. And once again, they have organized a guest for us today. I had no part in it. None of my co-hosts had any part in it. It's all the Weekly Space Hangout crew. So if you want to be really an executive producer in the space media landscape, you should join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are an incredible community, good friends to have. They'll keep you sane during our annual hiatus, our annual summer hiatus, and they'll put you in contact with all of the uh you know, astronomers and astronauts you could ever want to talk to. So go to WSHcrew.space and they will hook you up. All right, let's get on with this week's guest. We have uh, Dr. Janie Radabaugh, Radaba, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> We're excited to have you. Um, so why don't you tell people who you are and what you do? I am a planetary scientist, and I'm also a professor in geological sciences at Brigham Young University in Utah, where we want some of your snow from the East Coast. <laughs> Send it, please. You guys get plenty of snow. <laughs> we're, we're okay. We're yeah. kind of remoping right now because it's not as good as it's been, but we've gotten a little bit the last week, so that's good. Yeah. And, and you are involved in the Dragonfly team. Yes. Um, I don't know, many of you have probably heard of the Dragonfly mission. This is a rotorcraft lander for Titan. Oh, we've and heard of it. Titan's team. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what role do you play on the, on the project? Well, a science team is, uh, it kind of depends on the size of the mission. Ours is pretty big because it's New Frontiers. So it's kind of the mid-class, mid-range class of NASA missions, a billion dollars. And so there's something like 20 or 30 of us who are science team members um, all of us with various specialties who basically contribute to the preparation of the mission and also the analysis of the data when it gets back, kind of deciding where to land and what to look at and what's possible to do and what's important to do in order to answer our science questions. And we also help develop those all important science questions. We kind of, the public doesn't see that. They see, oh, there's a mission, but you've had to very carefully, you know, propose to NASA that you have something worth doing and that you can do it. How how often do you just sort of just sit stunned at the fact that you're sending a a nuclear powered quadcopter? I guess it's like hexacopter, octocopter yeah. to Titan. I mean, from the very beginning, I I've just been totally blown away by this idea. Uh, my friend Jason Barnes, who's a deputy principal investigator called me up one day and he said, Hey, I've got this idea. I think we should, you know, and I honestly, I honestly got chills sitting there in my desk and just thought, this is so good. Like, please, somebody, please pick this up. It's so good. And Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory did pick it up. And, you know, and we usually, you know, it's really hard. You have to run it through reviews a few times. You got to fail and you've got to just work on picking yourself up and re, re uh, submitting the idea. But we got it the first time around. And I, I mean, when we got down to just two uh, finalists, I thought, oh, my gosh, we might have a chance at this. And uh, and then it happened. And I, I still I'm still pinching mm -hmm. myself. I can't believe it. Because I, I'm pretty sure there's like a filter at NASA where where if the idea is too cool, they just <laughs> reject it outright. I know. It really seems like that because there's so much around safety. Like it's got to get there and succeed. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you can have these great ideas and balsa wood ball that impacts yeah. this, and, you know. And it just won't work. But um, but we were sitting on this cusp of not only is it cool, but we think we think we can prove that it works. Right. And 
you know, our drone technology had, had gotten to a point where um, we, we're doing remote drone activity all over the world all the time. And so that's ready. And, um, and Titan is just a perfect place to fly anything. It's much better than anywhere, better than Earth by yeah. far, to fly something. So it's just like begging for us to send something and just fly it there. Yeah, it feels like, you know, you make your proposal and then someone at NASA goes, yeah, but we do have this like old Viking chassis that we could use, that we could send, it's been proven. you know, yeah. and, and, but no, 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 we want a, like a brand new idea to have a, to mm -hmm. have a helicopter flying around on, on Titan. Yeah. With that platform, I mean, again, in all we know is what Huygens sent back really in the, and the the scans from Cassini from above, uh, what, how will Dragonfly change our understanding of, of Titan? I mean, Titan is, is a really unique place because it, it mixes water because the crust and lithosphere of the body are water, water ice, right? It's freezing cold out there. It's 90 degrees above absolute zero. So there's water ice, but we think there might be like volcanoes that erupt. And if it's a volcano, it's gotta be a water volcano or if there's a, an impact crater big enough to get through the atmosphere, an impactor that comes in, makes a crater, you would have melt molten water on the surface. So you have water, you also have organics. And we know this from a number of instruments on Cassini and also Huygens, for sure there's methane and ethane on the surface. And way up in the atmosphere, there's like propane, acetylene, butane, big long chain organic molecules. And then there's energy either from the chemistry or from sunlight. And all three of those things at the surface of the body, there's just no other place like that besides Earth that we know about. Right. Uh, and so give us, an, give us sort of an understanding of like what kind of ground you'll be able to cover and sort of what does the like the arrival and then how, do, how will it be getting to work? Yeah, and this is the other thing is that it's kind of taking our exploration to a whole different level because we've been able to do flybys since the 50s and uh, orbiters and then landers and finally rovers and rovers are really brave but we still we still only go you know tens of kilometers in in a lifetime of a rover and this is this is a whole different level um, because we think we'll be able to cover like tens to hundreds of kilometers um, <clears throat> like per hop tens of kilometers per hop yeah hundreds of kilometers over the course of the whole mission and that's that's just un unbelievable and un kind of we just don't even have a way of wrapping our minds around that yet. But, now, the, I mean, the, the light time to get to Titan is pretty significant. It, you know, you're you looking know. at what, like an hour plus to get signals? That's right. It's about an hour and a half. Right. To get signals out to Titan right. from, from Earth, I guess, depending on which side of the sun things are, things are lined up. Yeah. This, this, there's got to be a ton of autonomy and artificial intelligence going on at this point because it's flying. And I yeah. mean, everybody knows the first time you fly a drone, you crash it. <laughs> so. That's right. Well, what's so funny though is that I have a drone now. It's a, um, I don't, can I product place here? It's a sure. DJI Mavic 2 Pro. And um, I really, I think I have tried to crash that thing and I can't do it. Like it's, wow. it's, protects itself really well. And it tells me, no, no, no. And we're going to land. We've got 30% battery. We've got to land this, you know, like 30%. That's, yeah. that's but override. So, Mavic a override. Of, <laughs> yeah. A lot of the autonomy now is, is really, really good. And, and not only that, we have a really cool um, sleep frog technology that we're going to use where you fly over, you know, the first landing is going to be a little bit difficult because you have to land, you have to fly over somewhere, decide and then land. But after that, we'll have a safe spot. We go to the next place, fly over it, reconnaissance it come back and we have you know like days weeks of earth time to be able to analyze that and process all the elevation and the location and the ruggedness and everything to high precision and then we just say go here you'll be safe there and and, and as they go to that spot they overfly the next spot and then return to that new safe spot so it's really pretty pretty um, robust in terms of safety right how uh, a couple of people are asking in the chat just about about simulating it. How do you go about simulating a much thicker atmosphere and a much lower gravity here on Earth to well, test? Well, for one thing, yeah, to test. We so we're you know you can do all the math and you can kind of come up with the equations and that's that's what was used um, for the initial round. But there's a wind tunnel built at Johns Hopkins that's that's going to simulate these environments. Um, and that's ready. And I think they're putting some 
some elements in there right now and testing it. So some things are even starting to be built at this point, which is pretty cool. Oh, that that sort of led into my next question. What is the st- what is the state of the construction? Because again, I sort of feel like it could be that NASA is just pranking you and I know. they're just at some point, they're just going to go, oh, you really thought that we were going to let you fly an awesome <laughs> helicopter on Titan? Come on. No. Yeah. Um, I, so I should say these are these have to be just engineering models right now that yeah. are being built. NASA has to say, OK, you've passed this threshold. Go ahead and you know actually cut metal, um, the metal that's going to fly out to outer space. And so there are these kind of like little test um, systems that are put together and, and designs are, are being implemented. There's still you know, a lot of tweaking that can happen because we actually don't launch until 2027 um, now. We got delayed a couple of years for COVID, yeah. which is understandable. I mean, we want to be safe and, um, and also just use the resources in the best way uh, up until then. So, so that's a little bit extra time for development, which is good. And then the flight time. I mean, if you, if you leave it 2027, when do you right now get we're there? saying mid mid 2030s right. is when we, when we arrive right yeah but it's, it's all dependent on the launch vehicle everything depends on the launch vehicle and we don't have one set for sure yet um, i mean not even the europa uh, clipper has got one set yet and they're they're much closer to going so those those negotiations take a little while and of course the bigger the rocket the faster you get there and, and for outer solar system that matters a lot mm-hmm. you can cut years off the time several years if you go on a bigger rocket, but there are other trades involved in the bigger rocket, uh, lots of shaking, lots of G forces, and you have to decide if you want if you want that, and and, and if you have the money to buy it, you know. So. Right, and we'll be talking a bit what happens when people try to test out bigger rockets later on in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would like to talk about some of the big science questions that you're most interested in in sorting out about Titan. What 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 fascinates you? I mean, so the mission as a whole has this goal of looking for how far down the road did chemistry progress on the surface toward, you know, like biology, basically. Um, did, can we look at the chemistry and say, hey, look, there's, we see chiral molecules here and they all prefer one chirality. Um, that's not seen on earth unless life is involved in that. Or there's some spikes in big organics. There's nothing here there should be if it's just naturally formed, but here's a big one and then over here's a big one. And so they could be sort of like the lipids and the, you know, whatever things that are used by life. And so there are a lot of patterns, a lot of things we can do to see how far down the path of prebiotic chemistry did Titan progress. And, um, you know, like we do want to ask the question, can we see evidence of life? But, you know, that's going to be, that's a pie in the sky. So in the meantime, we say, what, what does chemistry do? And that kind of tells us about early earth to mm-hmm. some degree, right? We don't know how life started on the earth and um, seeing maybe the beginning stages of that on another planetary body is very important for us in understanding that process. Yeah, because like we see, say, simple biological molecules forming even out in space. We see amino acids being delivered by comets. We see yeah. alcohols and, and various things, as you said, on you know, lakes of methane on, on the surface of, of, of Titan, but it's that next step where they're getting into larger molecules, proteins, things like that, that, that seems, we don't know how life figured that part out. Do you think there's some kind of intermediate stage? You're talking about sort of chirality. Um, you know, what would be a smoking gun that would say, okay, we see, really strong evidence to help us understand which way life went. Right. And I mean, so the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. If, do I think there's going to be some something in between like life and amino acids, you know, which we we, we have a sense that there's this and this. I, I bet there are some more complicated things in the middle and maybe it's not organized by life, at least mm-hmm. like intelligently or whatever, purposely, purposely organized until here. And maybe there's more organization that needs to happen sort of biochemically or not bio, just chemically, geochemically. Um, yeah. So that now you've got a soup that's kind of like ready. Here's a perfect soup. And maybe things kind of spontaneously arise out of that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what happens. What, where's the spark? What is the, what's the key thing? And then I guess um, the other thing that's really interesting about, about Titan is, is it, it's sort of like it's Europa as well, because it's got this inner liquid ocean surrounded by this thick icy shell surrounded by this, this, um, methane seas and and really interesting hydrocarbons. 
do you is one of the goals to maybe see if if these layers are mixing somehow absolutely yeah we're in fact we're targeting an impact crater called selk it's a 80 kilometer diameter impact crater that looks kind of youngish you know and um it's right next to a whole bunch of sand dunes and is in the tropics where there's some indication that some liquid methane could could have been on the surface or could be transiently on the surface so you'd have all three of those like the liquid methane liquid water solid organics because the sand dunes on titan are made of organic poly, uh, molecules and uh, just particles yeah i was but wondering about that really when you call them sand them. like if yeah, you sand. if you brought them to earth what would they do like if you brought them oh to my like gosh, good question i really they, want my own sample would they, of sand. Would they just like just sand. float away into the air like would they would no, they it's, it's probably i bet they're a lot like just pieces of plastic I actually have a stream table in my department uh, and, and we use the media we use are, is plastic. They're just shaved down salsa dishes or something, you know, and uh, because it's so light, it's much easier to ma manipulate than quartz sand. Yeah. And so we use plastic sand, you know, in, in this case, we think the density is probably very similar to that because it's organic uh, particles. And because of the fact that they're organized into sand dunes, I think they're round and hard particles that get, saltated by the wind over time just like sand dunes on earth and that's a lot of what i do is i go out and look at uh, other features on earth that are a lot like what we see on other planets and so i've been to a lot of really big deserts just to wander around on the dunes and try to understand what's happening there because they're identical to the ones on right. titan in appearance and and you also i mean on titan the mountains are made of water of ice yeah. right water ice mountains that's so but weird they look a lot it's like a strange Earth's place mountains. yeah like it's, yeah it's amazing what temperature well it's amazing that landscapes on other planets have uh, a real similarity to each other once, once the same processes can occur um, we, we saw that in the beautiful glaciers meandering through glaciers of nitrogen through water ice mountain blocks on pluto yeah you know, it looks just like a landscape from earth and same with titan there are some desert dune desert landscapes that i i think i will believe i'm in the sahara desert when we're plopped down right on them and this sort of I don't know, uniformity of process, I think is very interesting. And I don't think we, we would have expected it until we saw it. And yeah. um, we have to go see it with spacecraft. I mean, like just everything shifted over one state. Like it's yeah. like here on earth, water is the liquid, but on Titan, water is the mountain. And on Pluto, mm -hmm. and, and here, um, you know, methane is a gas and on, titan methane is a liquid and then over on pluto it's a glacier <laughs> like it's, it's just funny how they they find the niche right something finds the niche right and, and fills that role right and yet, yet the behavior is the same bigger bigger small different different temperatures yeah it's it's so interesting um now you're not going anywhere near the lakes that's right so um, there are a couple reasons for that one is we need to be able to communicate directly with earth we don't have an orbiting spacecraft so we've got this antenna that's got to be able to point to Earth. And once you get up to the poles, it's just too hard to do that. And they're they're pretty far away. I mean, even though we can fly hundreds of kilometers, we still need to go a thousand kilometers to get to the poles. So um, so we won't go near the lakes. But, you know, if, if I had to bet, I would bet we'll find swamps or ponds of liquid methane. Yeah, I think they'll be present. I think there's going right. to be, like you say, you know, enough diversity of landscape, especially over that distance. And again, we just haven't grasped that. We've been used to, you know, a little gale crater or a little, you know, as much as those rovers have been able to do in those landscapes, we can go to many craters. We can go to, you know, several. We can go to this. We can even exit the, that climate zone to some degree and go just a little bit north or south away from the exact equator and see what we see. Uh, I got a great question from the audience from Arjone. What season will it be when it gets there? Will it experience multiple seasons on Titan? So... I don't think we know exactly what season it's going to be. I'm going to have to look again at what the 2030s are. So that's incorrect. I think we probably do know what the mid 2030s season is for Titan. Somebody um, has done the math. Yeah. Yeah. And one of you might figure this out before in the chat. Um, but then our, our plan is to operate. I mean, you know, the, the threshold mission is something like 90 days, but our baseline that we're working towards seriously is three years. Right. And, you know, the RTG baseline, will give you 20 years if you... Yeah, yeah I know because, and a lot of it just depends on our, our um, radioactive battery, really our power source, mm -hmm. our radioactive power source that charges up the battery. 
Um, as long as that can last and, and deliver enough heat to the instruments inside that need to be the portions that need to be kept warm, then should just be able to continue to operate. And so uh, then we'll continue to go farther and farther away from at least that crater, um, not too far north or south, but in that equatorial region. Right. And so really it's a, it's a communications issue yeah. for you. So, right. so I guess bringing a submarine as a tag along mission, <laughs> like ingenuity flying with perseverance, maybe that's a little Ooh. too awesome. That's fun. That's really awesome. Yeah. I don't know. Like maybe it should ride along. And that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah. Just deploy, deploy it and then itself. let it, let it swim around and maybe yeah. somehow, you know, transfer it. To, you have to add an orbiter. Anyway, they can figure so it out. So NASA, NASA Glenn is working on experiments with submarines for Titan. Yeah. Maybe yeah. No, I know. Pretty cool. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a viable future exploration technique. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, well, if people want to track your progress, um, watch what you're doing, uh, learn more about the mission and you, where should they go? The, you can just Google Dragonfly. Now it's starting to be one of the first things that pops up under a Google, but you can do Dragonfly mission, and that takes you right to the Johns Hopkins University website for Dragonfly. There's a lot of good information there and videos. Um, and I post things once in a while. I'm on Facebook publicly and also Rad Janie Rad on Twitter and Instagram. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Weekly Space Hangout. We're super excited. Definitely let us know when you're uh, when you're on your way. Yes. So happy to be here. Thank All you. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, let's move on to the news portion of this week. Uh, Morgan, let's let's talk about the, uh, the the dragon in the room. Let's talk about the uh, the SN nine test. It went boom. <laughs> yeah, I think what was striking about uh, SN nine is how similar it was to SN eight, um, where we had this basically perfect uh, liftoff. Although I have to say, in this test phase, it, the rocket is incredibly slow to get off the, the launch pad. It's, um, it did I, seem a little slower to get off the launch pad this this time, didn't it? It only had two engines, I think, this time. Didn't it have three no, no. They went with time? all three, and then you heard them shutting them down one at a time as they went up to their to the top of their their height. Uh, yeah. So it, it just it seemed really slow, but it got off the ground fine. It went up to 10 kilometers it kind of hovered there for a short while and then it began descending and then kind of doing this belly flop maneuver that we've kind of become familiar with and it rides that belly flop basically all the way down <laughs> and then at seemingly the last possible moment um it tries to re to relight the engines and rotate back up and Basically, all of those steps happened successfully again, right until the end. Uh, and in this case, in SN9's case, they reignited the engines, and then one of them seemingly went off. Uh, it lit for a second, and then it went back off. And some people saw what they thought was debris coming off the engine after the, the failed relight. Uh, and so the one remaining engine kind of didn't have anything balancing against it, and it kind of over-rotated the um, the lander. And so instead of not rotating enough, like we saw on SN8, this one rotated too much and hits the ground and kablooey. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it seemingly from external eyes, SpaceX seemed very confident going into this because they didn't bother to like clear the area. Like their next prototype is sort of in the blast radius of of SN9. And if they really weren't that confident, you think they probably would have been a little bit more careful with that. Um, and so this certainly seems like a different failure um, than what we saw in SN8, um, which is good in one sense, but also not so good because lighting and uh, turning on and off the, the engines was kind of something that we thought that had sort of been tested and understood. And I'm sure they're kind of scratching their heads about about that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and Fraser, we were talking before the show kind of about this maneuver because I think these two um, these two tests failing in basically the same way illustrates sort of an uncertainty that I have about this, which is that they wait till the very last second to mm -hmm. sort of turn the engines back on and um, and re 
reorient the spacecraft. And so when something doesn't go exactly right, there's not time to recover from it. And I think we saw that with SN9, where they had three engines coming down, they were all off, they relit two, one went out. Yep. And so presumably had they had time to relight the third engine, it would have been able to do the same job that, that the failed engine did and land the spacecraft successfully. Yeah. But because they waited until the last second, there wasn't time to for the computer to kind of work through all of those abort modes. Yeah, but I mean, computers think fast. So so it, it seems unreasonable to me that, that the computer didn't have time to work through the abort well, modes. Well, yes, I, I didn't mean that, like it couldn't iterate through them, but yeah. turning the engine, the next engine on takes some time, even if that is like, you know, right. a tenth of a second. A tenth of a second, yeah, yeah. When you're, you're plummeting down yeah. And so, horizontal. I mean, you're, and you're wondering, I know you're wondering, like, why don't they just perform the flip a kilometer up and then decel <clears throat> decelerate nicely into the landing? They've demonstrated that they do that. And it might even be that, I mean, maybe the math says it's possible, but it might be that there's too much just sideways motion of the, of the bottom end to counteract that quickly, that dependably. And so... I mean, I don't know whether they were just like showboating. No, I think that I, I'm, you know, I give them sort of credit here for having performed a test that they think seriously replicates the kind of uh, mission profile they intend to have. You know, otherwise the test is not nearly as, as valuable. I just, I'm curious, I would be curious to know why they chose, have chosen the mission profile they did. Mm -hmm. Because you might be totally right that a kilometer up is not like the forces external forces are not compatible with this kind of maneuver mm -hmm. but that's a choice that they made yeah they could have designed the overall like, um, like lander in a different way to accommodate a right. less last second yeah. maneuver and seemingly that's not the direction they've gone at least initially right when you look at a when you look at say a, a dragon with and it'll be the same thing with the with the super heavy it's you know it's the standard cylindrical rocket and then it's got the the grid fins that are up at the top that are sort of controlling the descent and orienting it to its to its proper landing but starship doesn't have those so it can't descend vertically and control itself in the way that it does with the the, the way that that the falcon does with the grid fins it's still got it's got the gimbling engines which is great but but they don't have the they don't have the same kind of stability descending that the that the other one does. So I think so I think that's the problem is that it is just a fundamentally different plan. And this is how they have to do it. They have to fall and then just before they crash, they have to kick out that bottom and then land. And yeah, it was uh you know you saw SN10 nervously sitting on the launch pad right beside it, getting its its Raptors installed, ready to go. Yeah, they haven't said much publicly at this point about what went wrong with the Raptor that seemingly was the source of the failure. Um, you know, if they're proceeding to install Raptors, they must be at least reasonably confident that it's not something that's sort of a systemic problem um, that they'd want to address before they before they did that. And in some sense, the fact that they failed for a different reason is is progress um, because they've so found and ameliorated at least one possible failure mode. Yeah, uh, And, you know, looking at how many rockets they have or how many starships they have sort of in various stages of construction, I mean, nothing's sort of wrong with this process. Um, and in some ways, the fact that we're sort of so seriously debating the design choices is indicative of how successful the program has been to this point where, you know, we're not asking at this point whether the, uh, the Raptor engine works. And we're not asking at this point whether the rocket is vibrationally sturdy as it goes up. All of those thresholds have been passed. Yeah. And we're down to what we know was the hardest one no, the for, for Falcon 9. Oh, the sec and this is the second hardest problem for this. What this do you think the hardest problem is? Re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at orbital velocity. Right. 
I guess that's not something that they're, t- they're, n- they're not at the point of testing that. Yet. No. Of the things they're testing. Yeah. They've sort of done the easy ones. This is the hard one. And the one that we know is a challenge for yeah. Falcon nine. Yeah. Um, and you know, I look forward to seeing, yeah. uh, seeing them try again. Yeah. I mean, I think they're going to nail this. They will, they will figure this out and this thing will be landing. But the question is, can it go from orbital velocity entering the Earth's atmosphere, bleed off all of that heat and velocity, and then return to Earth? That is, that is, in my opinion, the big unknown. I, I, I felt confident every part of this process. The one that I still think could make them go back to the drawing board is can they re-enter the atmosphere? I guess I'm not so worried about that because that that's the kind of thing that you can model with computers like pretty effectively. These sort of micro controls at the last second of landing have this sort of mechanical yeah. uh, connection to them that is, I think, harder to sort of understand in advance. But like being able to model the attack surface of of the capsule as it comes back in, I think that's a, sort of an understood problem and that they're within a few percent of where they, they'll end up a few percent of where they thought they would be. Right, they'll have to overbuild it a little bit or add some kind of ablative heat protection system as opposed to just going with the the plan that they have right now with just stainless steel and a little bit of heat tiles on one side. Yeah, we'll see. Do we know when, when SN10 is do for its maiden no, voyage we kind of, we've kind of glossed over and for i think good reason all the drama that sort of went down between spacex and uh the faa sure you want to talk uh, about that briefly and I don't, I don't think it's worth getting into regulations exist for a good reason uh there's also reasons to think that government isn't keeping up with uh the progress in technology but that's not a new story uh, long story short even with all of those sort of hiccups we're less than two months since the the attempt for sn8 and so one imagines that that cadence will only increase mm-hmm. uh and so we could be you know weeks to a month away from uh sn10 but i don't think there's been any official indications yeah. and and sn11 and sn12 i mean they're just going to keep just yeah, keep, they're keep just stacking up. There's already yeah. pieces all the way up to 17 for <laughs> some of them. That's crazy. And they're building super heavies now, too. So Yes, that, and they're going to try stacking that pretty soon, I think, with yeah. the, some of the early examples. So progress is happening sort of remarkably fast. Yep, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, I, you know, the it does sound like a pretty serious mistake with launching without the kind of proper FAA regulations that they were supposed to get. I mean, it sounds like the regulators are pretty mad that they launched and, and were pretty forceful that, that the human lives were at stake on, on them testing the rocket yeah, without well, getting clearance. M- move fast and break things starts to break down when yeah. you enter the physical world. Yeah. Yeah. When the things uh, are going to have to, yeah, those rockets. things have value and yeah. those people have value and so i'm confident that they will work out a testing regimen with the faa that permits them to get close to what they would ideally want to do while still sort of doing the right thing for the community and the environment yeah all right thanks uh thanks so much for that morgan all right uh brian what have you got for us so uh this is some recent research looking at uh using water to model black holes because we still haven't been able to build a black hole in a lab yet, you know, it Nor takes should mass and compression. It's just hard. So um, this is a, a thing. It's actually a, a long used technique because a lot of things have similar mathematics. So if you think of something like heat, we'll talk about the flow of heat. Well, heat isn't a fluid, but it follows very much the similar type of mathematical rules that a fluid does. So even though it's, you know, bouncing of atoms, it still follows this flow behavior. Well, gravity has a similar thing to fluids as well. There's, a, there's this fluid behavior within things like gravity waves and you know, gravitational waves and stuff. And so you can build water models of black holes. And, you know, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's basically you have some water and you pull a plug and you create right. a little vortex like you have in, in your bathtub 
and then you go, ooh, I have a black hole. I, I, so, I use that as a way to explain to people just what an accretion disk around a black hole is because it feels like it's the exact same process, which is there's too much water trying to go down the hole in your bathtub, and so the water piles up and starts to swirl around. Exactly. I'm doing this so, work so when I was like two. I think I've been scooped here. What, what's, what's that? So I, I was doing this work when I was like two years yeah, old. Yeah, no, I, so, absolutely. You should have got. Right. People you should are. Have, you could have had your doctor from me twenty five years ago. It's perfectly reasonable yeah. as a toddler to think that it's going to suck you down the drain. <laughs> you have a black hole in the tub now. Yeah, and you need to get out. <laughs> but but even though it works really well, you have to be very careful about um, the limits because obviously water isn't a black hole. And so you have to be careful about making sure that what you're assuming about how the water behaves correctly matches the way gravitational waves or black holes would work. And one of the things that they had thought there was an issue with is something called back reaction. And back reaction is basically just kind of a feedback effect that when you have an object doing something and it interacts with the environment, a lot of times in physics, just like we assume a spherical cow and a frictionless chicken, we'll, we'll assume that this object is acting by itself, not affecting the environment at all. So if you've had basic physics, you go, let's put a charge in an electric field and let's forget about the fact that that charge is affecting the electric field, which is affecting the charge. Right. So that's what a back reaction is. And these systems that you use to, to model black holes, because they're these, you know, containers of water and you're forcing it to drain, um, you're, you're kind of driving it, you're letting, you're letting it be driven. And so it was thought that, well, you can't really get a back reaction because it's not an interacting system. You've got this outside force basically that's driving everything and that sets everything off. Uh, and so, in this experiment, what they were doing was they were looking at how gravitational waves would interact with a black hole. So if you had a black hole in space and then you had you know, something that had triggered maybe some other merger somewhere off that had triggered these gravitational waves to go past this black hole. Mm -hmm. And so for this, with the water model, what they did was, you know, they start off the little spiral vortex, then they added just a little bit of ripples to the background. And what they saw was basically the, the ripples were actually pushing water into the vortex so that it would capture more water faster. Hmm. Like, so basically the gravitational waves would be triggering the, the uh, efficiency of the black hole to, to capture stuff and it would grow. And when they did their models, they found this reaction that, that it actually worked, but it happens really fast. So they would say they would watch this thing. And then when the ripples would hit, it would, the water level would drop fast enough that you could see it with the naked eye, which is surprising right. that you all of a sudden just the, the black hole model simulation is, is basically growing real fast. So there's a, there's a, there's a trick you can do if you are like trying to like, if you have like a two liter bottle of, of water or something like that, and you hold it over the sink and you, you turn it up and you let the water go out of it, it, you know, it goes glug, 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 and it actually takes a long time. But if you give it a bit of a spin, if you just like spin the bottle in your, in your hand to give it like a, like a, like a quick turn, then it creates this vortex and the air goes all the way, way up inside and the whole thing just goes dump. And it's kind right. of amazing if you've ever if you've ever done this. So, so I can see how ripples like you can sort of change the environment around the vortex, and that will increase the velocity that you're of water that is escaping the 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 bathtub. Right. But but how does that apply to the black hole? It's. I mean, is, so is, so it, is this a stretch ripples, or is this basically a? Basically, what it is is you've got this vortex of water. And on the surface of the water, you just have little ripples. So those little ripples really shouldn't cause the vortex to change very much. But what they found was when the ripples hit the vortex, it created a feedback loop that basically did similar to shaking it around. Yeah. It basically triggered it to, to spin faster and suck in more water. Right. So this little perturbation was enough to cause a big reaction. Right. So and then that's, that's the thing that was surprising. You know, is it possible that this somehow plays into the 
the question about how black holes got so big so early. If 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 we're looking at like black holes growing in a very specific way, but maybe you had gravitational waves early on that were triggering all over the place, maybe they could be encouraging black holes to accrete more quickly. Yeah, you certainly could. And and this article doesn't specifically address that. But but this type of thing where you would have kind of the gravitational waves interacting with a black hole would be much more common in the early universe when things were closer together. So so it's certainly something that could kind of trigger these supermassive black holes to form. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also says something about the limits of the model because in most of these models, you're assuming a, a kind of static background. And what's what this has shown is that not only can you see a back reaction effect, but you have to be even more careful that you can't necessarily ignore the background, that small changes in the background can do your, uh, can affect the system. And that means that if you're gonna model this stuff with water, you have to be really careful. So if you wanna do something with like Hawking radiation, the fact that you're creating ripples could affect incorrectly what, what right. you're doing. If you're not taking it into account. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's interesting that you say that they were able to see the the water level rot change with the with the you know with the eye that you could actually see just the ripples going through and the water level right. changing because it's it was able to draw more water more quickly it's really fascinating thanks brian mm -hmm. all right alex what have you got for us uh yeah so i uh there's this paper came out that's a pretty interesting result it's got tons of authors on it over 100 100 authors uh discovery of a system that was uh, first seen by the test spacecraft they call it toi 178 test object of interest 178 six planets in this uh system and five of which are in uh, orbital resonance so that's when you have sort of an integer ratio of orbital periods we see this in for example uh the three uh innermost large moons of jupiter mm -hmm. io europa and Ganymeder and what they call a laplace resonance one to two to four um and we see this uh, sometimes in other planetary systems, um, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. um, what's sort of interesting about these uh, resonant systems is that uh, you, you can only kind of get this, it's a very fragile uh, sort of arrangement. So you can only get this if they've sort of migrated very gently into their current position and then they sort of lock into this position. So it can kind of help stability in some cases, but also those things can go very unstable, very, uh, very easily. And so um, the, Planetary astronomers, people that are study uh, formation of um, uh, circumplanetary, excuse me, circumstellar uh, disks, protoplanetary disks, um, we're interested in you know sort of the the formation process of these of these systems. Alex, can how I these planets ask get you a question yeah. about that? So yes, I wrote about me. this story for for SciShow this week, and I was kind of head scratching the claim that they were making about they were need that this very complicated system is evidence of a kind of a, a quiet evolution, you know, mm -hmm. because in the solar system, resonances are kind of stabilizing forces. And so you see, for example, moons that are in resonance. Well, and those Neptune moons, and Pluto are in resonance. Yeah, and they, yeah, right. and, and they can actually withstand more than the average amount of trauma in the solar system. So I was kind of surprised that the same thing wouldn't be the case in, uh, in, in an exoplanetary system. Yeah, so I'm not a dynamicist. I'll point. I'll I'll uh, make that caveat. So um, I I don't know if I can answer the question to your satisfaction. But, but what it if we put it in terms of a these, a planet yeah. with six moons, an exoplanet with six moons? Would that uh -huh. would that make it easier for you? Well, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very sort of analogous systems. Actually, I've been working on this uh, recently of, of yeah. kind of looking at the dynamics of uh, multi moon systems. Uh, I was going to uh, mention it uh, later on, but. Yeah, I mean, you're right that in these sort of systems, um, basically when you hit a resonance, um, that can have an effect of uh, uh, destabilizing, basically, because then you start kind of, it's almost like uh, pushing the swing. This is sort of the analogy that I've heard before. Uh, you push the swing right at the right amount of time and you keep kind of pumping more energy into the system. If you push the swing at the wrong time, then it's, it's sort of working against each other. Um, so you're right that in some cases it's it's sort of stabilizing because they're kind of holding each other in a sort of mutual embrace. But in other times, uh, if the arrangement is a little different, you can be pumping energy into the system in a way that's sort of um, uh, 
uh, builds up, I suppose, and can ultimately destabilize these systems. Not immediately, but over over uh, long periods. So, so when they uh, say that it was a, anyway. that it was a gentle process, just just like textbook protoplanetary disk lumps forming in the disk, planets forming out of the out of those lumps, and then the star clearing out all of the intervening material, and boom, you've got your planets, and then they lock into resonance, and and it's all done. Yeah, no so I, I think wacky the, migration right, like we had here. Right. So the, I think the idea is that uh, there's an interaction with a protoplanetary uh, disk uh, during this migration that damps out the eccentricities of these planets, and that is what allows them to kind of uh, gently uh, find their places in these uh, in these resonances. But a lot of times that disk uh, dissipates before these eccentricities are are damped, and that's that's how you can kind of uh, be in a resonance, but not in these very low eccentricity orbits. And so, does that rule out kind of bonkers migration like we had in the solar system? You know, Uranus uh, and Neptune for switching this, places, Uranus being shoved over on its side, Saturn. Right. For this particular system, anyway, they make the argument that uh, that yeah, well, it, that couldn't have... that couldn't have happened, and so and so, uh, and they, they argue that this is sort of a pristine um, uh, environment for seeing, you know, kind of what was the shape of this uh, uh, circumstance, uh, circumstellar disk, and it's particularly interesting because these planets are uh, some of them are you know super earths or mini neptunes in other words some of them are rocky some of them appear to have a gaseous material and unlike um, the, sort of the expectation that you would have them all kind of uh, getting less and less dense as you uh, go farther out they're sort of jumbled up uh, one next to each other so you have some rocky ones then you have a bigger uh, sort of more gaseous envelope one and some other rocky ones uh, it's sort of an unusual in um, the sort of arrangement of planets if you assume that they have migrated very gently and haven't switched places or anything like that. That's the weird thing about this system is it both seems like it must have been pretty chaotic because the planets forming in this order seems, you know, unlikely, but also supposedly had to have evolved very slowly. It's just kind of a weird, weird system. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think they, I think they would make that argument that, that this is, this is sort of posing uh, uh, new puzzles. So, you know, we, we like kind of finding these things that defy easy, easy explanation. Um, but, you know, sort of an interesting tidbit of this uh, particular story is that they were going after something rather different than what they found. Um, they identified three planets initially in the, in the test data. And two of these planets, they had very similar uh, period solutions. One of them was like 9.9 .9 days and the other one was like 10.35 days or something like that. So they thought it was this weird sort of co-orbital system with these like horseshoe orbits. Um, and uh, so they got some follow-up times and then they didn't see the 10.35 day uh, planet transit. They said, well, there must be huge transit timing variations, which would be of course consistent with this uh, weird sort of arrangement. So they got an astonishing amount of telescope time. They got 11 days of continuous observations on uh, the Kiops um, wow. space telescope, eleven days. I mean, that's that's wild. That and telescope has barely been up for eleven days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just recently got up there. So uh, the fact that they got this amount of time is just amazing to go after this system yeah. that they thought was. Uh, rather, you know, very exotic. It turns out it wasn't so exotic. That 10.35 day planet uh, was actually just a 20.7 day period planet. Uh, and that's why they missed half of those transits because it was at, at half the orbital period. But in the process, they identified three additional planets. They figured out the correct period for that one and they figured out uh, these other um, three planets. So, I mean, so it's it's six planets. Altogether, I mean, isn't which this is really great. like a, a validation of Kiops? Because, I mean, just the machine seems to be working. Tess found something, an object of interest, then punted it over to Keops, which is a, which is a characterizer, and it went right. to work really deeply understanding the system itself. It feels like you've got this kind of perfect tag team situation now, where you've got Tess digging them up and and Keops confirming them. Yeah, see I think a lot it's a more of this. yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. It's exactly what it was uh, designed to do, I think. And uh, and what's exciting, you know, this is we've seen, you know, Trappist one, for example, similar kind of system, but this particular star is brighter. Um, it's actually, uh, uh, you know, instead of an M dwarf, it's a 
it's a K dwarf, you know, getting a little more solar like. Um, and, uh, and because it's brighter, it's uh, we've, first we've been able to get uh, radial velocity measurements for this. And so uh, they, they can measure all the masses for this planet with Trappist. I think they use transit timing variations and sort of backed out the masses that way. But with, uh, um, uh, you know, they're able to get these radial velocities. And, and excitingly, uh, these planets are also going to be ripe for um, probably transit spectroscopy. You know, when, when, once we've got a bright enough star, uh, we yeah. can sort of uh, probe these, uh, uh, probe these. Uh, we just need uh, the ex atmospheres, yeah. The extremely large telescope to come online, and then we'll get we'll get that to you. <laughs> Fantastic! Really yeah, exciting. can't wait, can't wait. Uh, Morgan, mm -hmm. we just got a couple of minutes left. Do you want to just give a give us a quick update on Venus, life on Venus? Yes. Probably not. What? Uh, so, so I know, shock, shocker here. We talked in the fall about this uh, paper that uh, purported to have identified phosphine gas in Venus's atmosphere. And here on Earth, phosphine gas is principally a uh, product of life. But more importantly, the chemistry of phosphine is such that when it interacts with ultraviolet light from the sun, it gets broken up. And so if you're seeing phosphine gas, you are seeing phosphine gas that was relatively recently produced. So that means that not only is this a biomarker, it's a present day biomarker. So we got really excited about this. Lots of theories about where this could be coming from. Uh, but a new paper that came out uh, this past week looks at the exact same data set. They took the data basically that was collected by the original team and they reanalyzed it to argue that there probably isn't phosphine gas in that observation after hmm. all. And I actually really love this paper because I think both the first uh, paper from last year and this one did good science. And the kinds of things that this hinges on are the kinds of little details that matter when you're kind of on the cutting edge of this. Mm -hmm. And so these observations were being done in the radio spectrum. So you point a radio telescope at Venus and they were observing some spectral lines. And the line that phosphine is visible at in the radio happens to be the same line that, or very, very, very similar to the line that sulfur dioxide is visible at. And sulfur dioxide is one of the principal components of Venus's atmosphere. Yeah, no question. So, you would, yes, there is sulfur dioxide. Yeah, you would not in, make any surprise atmosphere. announcements if you found sulfur dioxide. And so what the original team did was look at another spectral line where you can see sulfur dioxide, but not phosphine. And they said, okay, if we don't see a lot of sulfur dioxide, then probably it's also not contributing to the other spectral line. And, and that's what they saw. They said, there's not a lot of sulfur dioxide in this particular part of the atmosphere that we're looking at. And thus this other very prominent line is probably due to, to phosphine, not SO2. Um, and that was sort of the basis for their claim. And this new paper took that same data and they did two important things. The first is they ran some simulations to simulate what the spectral lines should look like at different points in the atmosphere. And what they found was that the shape of the line was such that it probably came from higher up in Venus's atmosphere. And we can tell these things because things like pressure that a gas is under affects the shape of the line that is absorbed or emitted um, by, by that species. And so they looked at this, the shape of the line. They said, this is higher up in the atmosphere. And if phosphine gas was present that high in the atmosphere, it would be destroyed so quickly by the sun, like in, in, on the order of minutes, that the amount of phosphine that would have to be produced is just like ridiculous. There's just no way that phosphine could be produced that quickly to account for what they saw. And then they also looked at the way the telescope was set up. So a lot of these observations were done using ALMA. And ALMA has, you know, radio telescopes are weird and they have all of these different sort of knobs you can turn. And the paper looked at, at the ALMA configuration that the original researchers used. And they said that if you configure it this way, you have the side effect of making gases that are everywhere seem less prominent than gases that are only in small pockets. And what that would do, since we know sulfur dioxide is everywhere, it tended to depress the amount of sulfur dioxide that ALMA was reporting. And so when they did that really smart check, the first team, on that second spectral line and concluded, oh, there's actually not a lot of sulfur dioxide, that was probably an illusion. And that would sort of throw off the whole chain of reasoning that led them to claiming phosphine. Right. Um, and so I think, 
that the original team did sort of smart, careful soft science, mm-hmm. and this team went back and used the exact same data set and did smart, smart, careful science. And we now have kind of two interpretations of the same data set, and that means we need more observations. Now, sort of the balance of our belief should go not towards life because that's kind of the status quo. And so this paper suggests that there's good reason, if you didn't already think so, to think this is not life causing this. Yes. But it also points out that sort of a different kind of observation might help provide a different vector on this problem that would kind of make that clearer. And so I I was kind of really happy with this sort of mini science story that played out over the last six months around this topic. And I think it it sets the stage for how difficult it's going to be to confirm and find biosignatures on other on exoplanets that 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 there was an argument over one of the closest places to earth and and it was really hard to make this kind of both the observation and to make any kind of conclusive uh, answer about what it is that you're looking at. And so you could just imagine what it's going to be like when James Webb turns up evidence of methane on TOI 671 or whatever was the... Uh... Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. Yeah. I think if you wanted to say that it will be impossible to find biosignatures on exoplanets, I think you would be closer to the truth yes. than you would be from the truth. Yes. Uh, and, and so it, at some point it kind of devolves into philosophy about like what counts as what is life evidence yeah Uh, and you know you kind of work your way down to ontology or something and just like what do we know (laughs) exactly Uh, yeah you yeah we'll get to this part where where we just we just got to agree to disagree like i just i'm pretty sure there's life there man what is what is life who uh, am i yeah fortunately venus is much closer than an exoplanet and so if nasa ever decides to actually send another venus mission these are the kind of questions that we will sort of know to be on the lookout for yeah um and we'll probably get answered relatively straightforwardly if we if we're looking in the right place at the right time excellent all right you're on my screen so why don't you let us know what you're working on and where people can find out more yeah Yeah. i had an awesome video come out on scishow space yesterday talking about it's a history episode talking about the leviathan at parsons town which was sort of the last of the great classical telescopes before you get into the 20th century kind of modern astronomy. And they basically had to build a castle just to hold a telescope. Wow. And it, it, it was the first telescope to make discoveries of other galaxies, even though we didn't know it at the time. But it also proved that this old kind of gentleman scientist way of doing science was not going to scale to the 21st or to the 20th century. And, and so it was kind of like the last big hurrah of the, of the old scholar, uh, idea of, of doing astronomy right it was the extremely large telescope of the time yes and uh it it proved that we need a new we need space telescopes but maybe, in the 20th century maybe the overwhelmingly large telescope needs a castle maybe if it gets a castle then then it'll get built <laughs> awesome um all right alex yeah uh what am i working on i just uh i've sort of alluded to it before but uh i've been studying recently uh what happens when we have multiple moons in uh, exoplanetary systems i think i've mentioned on the show before that in in general a lot of our work is surrounded around a single moon case but if we look at the solar system jupiter saturn uranus neptune obviously uh, many more than the single moon that we have around the earth so uh, how does that going to affect our observations that's what i've been working on uh, recently and getting some interesting results too early to say uh, what those are of course mm-hmm. but hopefully get the paper out before too long and then and maybe you want to follow me just follow me 20 on 20 um, days Twitter. of keops time that comes next. <laughs> well, I'd love to get 20 days of key off stuff. Yeah. That would be that's fun. what it's going to take. That's what your number, that's what your Monte Carlo simulations tell you is 20 <laughs> days of key off time. I'll put it in my next take. proposal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, Brian. Oh, let's see. Mostly what I'm working on this week is a, a book on the history of the VLA for NRAO. Uh, You're writing a whole book? I am, I am editing a book. I've got a team of people. Oh, okay, okay. This is, this is an NRAO project, so look for it in fall. Um, but you can find me at my website, which is briancoberline.com. You can find me at Brian Coberlein on Twitter. Um, you know, and you'll find me at Universe Today from time to time. Awesome. All right. Uh, so I've got, uh, I'm going to be interviewing Chris Prophet, who we interviewed a couple of years ago, talking about SpaceX from the ground up. He has written the 
fifth version of his book. And uh, it'll be perfect timing to talk about all the interesting things that are happening with SpaceX. So that's going to be on my YouTube channel tomorrow at 11 a 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. I haven't made the event yet, but I will do that uh, shortly or tomorrow morning when I get up. So, um, so that'll be tomorrow. And then I think I've got some other interviews again next week as well. So lots of good stuff still coming out. Um, and of course, the universe today on all the things. All right, I'm gonna put everybody back on the screen. There you all are. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us this week. Thank you to our special guests. Thank you to my co-hosts. Always a pleasure seeing the random collection of human beings I get to hang out with every week. Uh, thanks, of course, special thanks to Nancy Graziano and the rest of the Weekly Space Hangout crew for keeping us all organized and bringing us such excellent guests. What a, what a wonderful guest. So, all right, thanks everybody, and we will see you all next week.